Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Kip Wallen and he is a senior director with SRS Aquium. And we're going to talk all about, you know, that mid-market, that um, PE firm, strategic acquisition, that type of role. So that you guys out there who are buying these companies know what to do, be prepared for when you sell them. Most of our audience, I'm going to set you up here, Kip. Most of our audience are the small to medium guys. They're buying companies in that SBA alone and slightly above. Some of them are starting to raise some capital. But our audience has the aspiration to grow them up, sell them to the PE firms and take that ride. So the stuff we're going to talk about today is going to help them, set them up for success. So thank you for being here today. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, Ron. We always start off with the origin story. And you know, I always joke around, it's like, how in the hell did you end up on a mergers and acquisitions podcast? So kind of give everybody a, a, a brief overview of like how you got into the space you're in now. And then we'll talk about SRS and what it does. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm an M&A attorney by background. Um, uh, I've been practicing online M&A deals for about 10 years. And I mostly focused on those lower middle market deals. Um, so kind of that $50 million or less range. And I, I've, I've, as a lawyer, I've always been working out of Denver. So kind of working on, you, you know, deals based out of Denver. But since joining Lesser Earth Aquium, right, where, you know, we see deals all over the world. So I really had a chance to, you know, in the last six years as a, as a team member at Lesser Earth Aquium, just getting this view, this almost like world view into M&A. And because we get engaged so often on M&A deals, we're able to collect all this really great information. So we view it, you know, our mission as a company is really to help make these M&A deals more efficient. And one way we, we can do that is by putting data out there and, and informing the market about, you know, what we're seeing, what the trends are. So I've always really been interested in statistics and data. My master's is in econometrics. Um, and, then, and then I went to law school, you know, right, right around the 2008 time period was, was when that happened for me. So kind of obvious reasons why, why that made sense. Uh, yeah, and then I just I really enjoy the aspect of of sort of the collegial or this this shared goal, right? So many times in the legal profession, right? Since, you know, since I went to law school, looking at the various practices of law, you know, so much of it is adversarial. But M and A is this really fun. It's complicated. Every deal is unique. It's always exciting. It's always changing. And at the end of the day, we're all working towards the same goal. So that's what I love about M and A. It's just people coming together, trying to make good deals. Everyone coming out ahead. It's this kind of, you know, we always hope that it's a win-win situation. Doesn't always end up that way, of course. And so, you know, we can talk about some of the things that go wrong today on the podcast. But yeah, I just I keep getting pulled in by the passion and and just the excitement that the deal parties have. And you know, for a lot of folks, and I'm sure a lot of people listening in, when they do go to make that exit, I mean, that's a big moment in their life, right? I mean, you know, they get married, they have kids, and then they made their exit, right? It's their big payday. It's a big moment in their life. It's memorable. And to be a part of that is, it is really exciting. So uh, yeah, I'm just excited to be here. And, and I will admit I am a data nerd, but I love talking about data, um, but I'll be sure to kind of make sure we, we kind of explain the concepts as well. Uh, and yeah, just excited to have the conversation with you, Ron. Awesome. Awesome. And you know, for most of these uh, people out there who are selling a company, unless they're in the VC route where they've just done multiple startups and or they're acquisition entrepreneurs where this is their they're not just operators. Their business is buying, selling, and, or buying, growing, and then selling companies. That's a one-time event in their life for most of these guys, right? For most of these guys, they built something over 10, 15, 20 years, maybe even two, three generations. And right. you know, now it's time to do something different with it or sell it. And uh, so this is a one-time event. It's new for most of them. 
uh, up until recently, not much of it was taught in college <laughs> for most of these guys. So even if they had a degree or in, an MBA, you could make it all the way through a master's degree without ever learning a single thing about mergers and acquisitions other than maybe the definition of it, right? Yeah, and it's very niche and it, and it evolves. So yeah, you got to stay on top of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It is definitely an evolving thing. It changes with the economy. It changes with regulations. It changes, you know, with market sentiment. Right. You know what, how the market perceives the economics it makes a big difference. So if they right now we're still in that thing, I think I've been saying this for two years now, but we're in that state of in uncertainty. So that that has a, a play in it. Yeah, certainly the macroeconomic conditions. Yeah, you got to you got to pay attention to those as well. And, you know, we're in a moment of transition right now. So, you know, we can get into this as we as we talk today. But yeah, it's, you know, what I love about entrepreneurs, I love working with entrepreneurs because they, I mean, they're personality wise and just work ethic wise. I mean, they're just incredible people. Um, they also are, they're problem solvers, right? And they're roll up your sleeves and do it yourself kind of, kind of people. And that's exactly what you want for these, you know, early stage companies. Um, that's what it takes, right? That grit that people talk about. The sort of, you know, it's not really a problem, but just sort of the consideration though, is when you go to make that exit, you actually are going to negotiate and enter into that merger and acquisition deal, right? M&A is, is a niche type of deal. They're very nuanced. They can get very complicated very quickly. Yes, there's kind of things that are done a certain way, but then every deal is unique. So things change, can change up. So one hurdle that I see a lot is, you know, these entrepreneurs, they're very, they're self-starters, right? By, by nature. Um, and they usually can figure things out on their own. But I, I can't stress enough the importance of making sure you have good information, hiring the right advisors and picking the right partner, right? You know, whoever you're selecting to be your buyer, making sure that that's a good fit as well. And that's, it's really hard to do. And like you say, you know, that might be only a one-time thing for these folks. And so having the right information, working with the right advisors goes a long way when you do make that exit. Yeah, I've talked at this point, I've talked to a few hundred uh, well over that probably, uh, small business owners. And I, I, I hate to tell you how many times I've had the conversation with either the advisor and or the, uh, the business owner. It's like, hey, you got the wrong guy, right? I've had, I've had conversations with the attorneys and advisors and stuff like, look, you're not doing this guy any favors. You're a divorce attorney. Yeah, you've known him for 15 years. You don't know anything about mergers and acquisitions. You're freaking out by terms and stuff that are standard in every contract you're ever going to see. And you're not, you're not really representing the guy. All you're doing is hurting him. But, uh, and it happens. People reach out to, especially in the rural communities where it's not a lot of mergers and acquisitions, attorneys around. That's not a common thing. Every big city has them. You just, they don't know to hunt them down, right? So they go to the guy that wrote their, uh, you know, their operating agreements. So whoever, you know, their family attorney or family friend, you know, ha they have a family friend that's an attorney who happen to have one attorney on staff that does some operating agreements. So uh, that's the guy that wrote it, set up the LLC, did all that paperwork and you know, got them going years ago. And now they go back to them and go, hey, I'm thinking about selling it. Instead of the attorney going, yeah, you probably need an M&A attorney. They take on things they shouldn't take on. And it happens a lot more than, than I think should happen. I think that the attorneys should look at things and go, this is way out of my bailiwick, right? Yeah. And you always want, I mean, when you're out there looking for buyers, right, you want to present your best foot, you know, put your best foot forward and, and having an advisor that knows M&A and understands, you know, what, what makes your company look like a clean deal, a healthy deal, right? Not those kind of red flags that, that you, you know, buyers might, you know, want to, you know, put special provisions in the agreement to account, you know, all these nuances and things you want, you want to have your company be as clean as possible. So having an expert from the start, you know, to go through your data room, make sure all of your contracts are in order, make sure your cap table is up to date. There's just so many things you have to look at. And, Ron, and you know, Ron, you made a good point. They don't really teach this stuff in law school or, or business school. You really only learn it by doing. So yeah, go out there and find the people with the experience. That, that, that's the best advice I can tell you. So let's get into SRS and the data you've collected and kind of what you're seeing, because I'm intrigued by uh, any knowledge, any of that type of stuff that it can help us do better in our deals for forecast what's coming down the road or anything like that. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'll start with SRS Aquium, just, just sort of a brief overview. We started, we're almost, we've been around almost 20 years now. Um, so a lot of times when you have an, an exit transaction, um, when the deal closes, that's not really the end of the transaction. You've got a lot of post-closing matters that, that are negotiated into the agreement and that require attention during that post-closing period after closing. So, right, big things that come up post-closing, you know, if there's indemnification in favor of the buyer, 
if the buyer needs to make a claim, that's going to happen post-closing. Um, if there's a purchase price adjustment, which is very, very common for private target M&A, and we can talk about working capital purchase price adjustments, kind of what they are and how they operate. Um, and then also if there's an earnout, what we should talk about earnouts today, because especially on lower middle market deals, just an incredibly important um, factor. And also I would say a pretty important tool in how a lot of deals in the current market are getting done. Kind of, you know, there's some interesting creative financial engineering going on and earnouts is one of those. So we'll get into those a little bit. Um, but because you have these post-closing matters that come up, but the nature of the transaction is, you know, buyer comes in at closing and they now own that business. They operate that business post-closing. Um, and there's not really anyone around, right? Management team maybe now works for the buyer post-closing. And there's not really an entity or a management team around anymore to represent the interests of those selling shareholders, right? Because, you know, it might be a few founders selling, but you may have done a few rounds of, of fundraising. Maybe you have a VC investor that's also on the sell side. Maybe you have private equity invested already. And so uh, a shareholder representative basically is the person that steps into that role and kind of manages all those post-closing matters. And so that's where we got our start. So before SRS Ackman was around, people would kind of have to do it yourself. Like maybe a private equity guy or a venture capital um, partner would, would step in to that role. But it's, first off, it's a lot of administrative hassle. You know, just, I mean, we have teams built out to handle all of it. And, you know, we're really efficient. Like it's what we do professionally. But if you have to do it on your own as an individual, it's usually just a lot of tedious work. Um, but also it can kind of interrupt your personal life. One of the reasons we got started is actually because one of our founders is a venture capital guy. He was a shareholder rep on a deal and there was a, a claim made by the buyer. So he was named in a lawsuit, right, as the shareholder rep. And he went to like acquire some financing and they're like, we can't, we can't give you any credit because you've got this hundred million dollar judgment against you. He's like, no, 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 that's not me. That's, you know, this other role, but the creditor didn't, you know, so little things like that you don't even think of. And so in addition to shareholder rep, we also will act as an escrow agent and paying agents. We also have financial services that we can offer. Um, really, our role we view is just trying to take some of that tedious stuff off the deal party's plate and make it really efficient and, and easy. Uh, we use online platforms so that you know we can ensure that information is being kept secure and you know things are being verified, like like uh, tax identification numbers and routing numbers and all all those kind of you know very detailed things. We want to make sure everything is right and everyone gets paid on time. Those kind of logistics are what we help with at SRS Aquium. And so we get engaged on about 10% of the market for U.S. private target M&A. And when we're engaged as a shareholder, we, can, we have all the documents, right? We see the merger agreement. We see all the ancillary agreements. And so we pull all this really great data out of those engagements um, to get a sense for how these deals are being negotiated. So we'll look at the financial uh, structure of the deal. We'll look at those reps and warranties, right, that where the indemnification comes into play. We'll look at things like closing conditions and um, you know various legal standards that might get included and are, and are often negotiated. And we track all of that and put it out uh, to the market, right? It's in various reports and studies and articles because we want we want the market to have that information. We think that'll make deal making more efficient and and effective, right? People kind of have an understanding of you know what's common on deals, right? You might hear the phrase "what's market." Um, it's just an idea of like, are we in the, are we in the ballpark or, you know, are we, are we, when we're negotiating this deal and we're pushing back on certain things, are, we, are our re requests reasonable? Having that information really goes a long way again, because you want to be putting that best foot forward. You want to, you want to appear to the buyer that not only do you know your company, but you, you know, you, you know how to negotiate this deal and, and navigate this transaction. Um, so that's really my full-time job at SRS Aquium is I take all this data um, you know, we look at what's interesting about it and we put out helpful resources for deal parties and M&A practitioners out there. You know, I've looked at a few of these term sheets and stuff like that and the reps and warranties and all that. And you, you look at them and, and, and a layman, a business owner like myself, a lot of it looks like overreaching and you're like, you're getting told by one attorney, their attorney always, oh, this is just standards in every contract. But I don't have the data to support that. that that's just, you know, it's, it's hearsay. It's what they're saying it is, right? So, you know, having somebody like you and you have that data, you can go, yeah, this is the trend. This is what's normal. These, you know, if you brought 15 buyers in here, all 15 or, or sellers uh, or sorry, buyers in here, all 15 buyer attorneys are going to have those exact same phrases. And wait a second, this one's an outlier. This one's a little overreaching where I would look at them and go, they all look overreaching. <laughs> right. Or, you know, so 
having that knowledge base and the history, the history of um, of what is normal, what's going on, what the current trends are, uh, what's you know what's part of the transactional thing, what triggers certain things. So sometimes things are only normal when there's a red flag, right? If you see a lot of account receivables and in, in, in a slow receiving time, there's probably some statements in there that says that you know we we included that in the valuation if we're unable to collect from that from them then we have to have a price adjustment right that type of stuff i, I get but what is the go are they becoming more complex over the last few years as you're looking at these or are they is there any effort to simplify these the process and and the terms in these contracts yeah a little bit of both actually it kind of depends on the on the particular provision so if we were talking about like earnout provisions, they're getting way more complicated and not, not necessarily in a bad way. It's just the deal parties are now really spending a lot of time and putting a lot of effort in to try and make sure that the outcome matches the intent of the parties, which is, you know, what you're always trying to do when you draft these, you know, very long hundred page agreements. All those words are really just trying to get at the outcome that the parties are intending. And, you know, again, right, the reason I love M&A is the buyer wants the business to do well. The sellers, of course, want the business to do well and maximize the value of the exit. So everyone's interests are kind of aligned, but, but buyers are going to be very mindful of the asset they're buying, essentially, right? The business that they're buying. So right off the bat, the, the, probably the first thing you want to focus on or think about if you're, if you're kind of in that exit timing, um, well, and actually, but look back up even, even further than that, when do, when do you even start thinking about an exit, right? This is a big question. It's not months before you're going to make the exit, right? It's years, right? At least a year, if not more, because it's going to take you time to kind of get your own house in order. So in 2021, um, kind of coming out of the, well, I mean, we were still within the pandemic, but kind of coming out of the extreme of the 2020 effect on the market, there was a lot of economic stimulus um, and that was supercharging the economy. And of course that spilled over into M&A. So 2021 was just a banner year for M&A, incredible record deal volumes, really high valuations. So maybe even targets that maybe weren't worth what they were getting were able to get really high valuations, just kind of given where the market was. And it was very fast paced. So buyers were competing with each other. They wanted to get that acquisition. They had to move fast. They had to offer a really you know, favorable terms, essentially, to beat out the other competing buyers. And one way they would save time is maybe not doing quite as thorough due diligence. So due diligence is kind of, you know, that looking under the hood, kicking the tires, right? The buyer is going to want to know everything about your business. They want to know who your, who your big um, customers are. They want to know how long you've had those customers. They're going to want to know if you have any pending lawsuits. They're going to want to know what your relationship with your employees are like. They're going to want to see that capitalization table, right? Which is basically a listing of everyone who owns the company, right? Whoever has equity interest in the company um, and how much they have. All these like little details, the buyer's going to want to see all of that. So due diligence is that process. It's you know what we what we call it. You're going to set up a data room, a virtual data room in today's market. So you're going to put all that information, you know, on an online platform where then the buyer's going to go in and they're going to start looking through all that. So in 2021, buyers were doing due diligence, but they were doing kind of the whatever the minimum amount was necessary to get the deal done. When the market kind of slowed down in 22 and 23, deal making slowed down with it, the pace of deal making, and buyers all of a sudden had this luxury of time. And they now were like, all right, we're going to spend more time on due diligence because we learned from 2021. We were buying some of these companies and maybe we overpaid. We didn't see some of these potential issues that we normally would have caught during due diligence. So the last couple of years, buyers have really focused on thorough, complete due diligence. And that, of course, is going to impact the deal terms, right? How big the escrow is, how many escrows there are, right? The buyer's going to want some sort of security for these issues that they uncover during due diligence. So as a, as a seller, the first thing you want to do is get that data room as fully populated, cleanly organized, demonstrating just how great your company is. There's no red flags. There's no issues. Everything's perfect. You want that data room set up before you even start talking to buyers, right? Before a buyer gets anywhere near that data room. So that, that's a huge critical component and it takes a lot of time and it takes the right people to help you do that as well. So that's probably one of the biggest impact that we've seen on deal terms these last couple of years is because buyers are doing all this due diligence, it's having an impact on how they negotiate that indemnification, that post-closing protection 
that they get for the for the reps and warranties. So that's going to be the most important thing to think about is, you know, buyers are not, you know, it's not 2021 anymore where like things happen quickly. Buyers are being much more opportunistic, much more careful and much more thorough. It's interesting that all that occurs in that upper uh, lower market. So I can tell you in the 200 plus deals I've looked at and we're looking at deals like, you know, every day now I've got a couple of clients where we're hunting for things. I can count on one hand how many times I've seen a really well put together deal room. And the reason I say that is we're looking at businesses that are SBA loan qualifiable. So $5 million transactions and below, maybe seven at nine, if you can get some type of that little, you know, extra loan at the other end of it, these small mom and pop, you know, one, $2 million uh, EBITDA businesses, they're not using investment bankers, right? They're using somebody, uh, you know, as a broker and the brokers, be quite honest, in most states don't have any, it's a low hanging fruit type of thing to get a broker's license in most state. Some states you don't need one at all. You just, you know, stripe that, stripe broker on your tie, uh, on your business card and bam, you're a broker. That said, like I said, I can count on, on one hand how many times I've seen something where like everything I need is right here, right? That would be a unique experience for uh, those of us who look through a lot of small business deals. And most of them get turned away because they're not well put. We don't need that full data room, but they're not put, they're still not put together well enough that it's easy to look through and go, this is a great thing. We have to ask for a lot of stuff. It, that's what, when somebody says it takes, you know, 90 to 180 days to get a small business deal done, it's not for any other reason. It's just we have to ask for stuff and it usually takes seven to 10 days to get delivered. Right. You know, I want to see a rolling 12 month or, you know, month over month, 12 month cash flow for the last three years. Right. If I think your business is cyclical, I want to see what the business cycles are. Is it seasonal? Do you have certain issues? Right. Oh, we've never done that. Give us a few days and we'll have the accountant put it together. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's a lot of really great resources out there. You know, example, due diligence checklist. It's pretty easy to, if you kind of spend a little time doing some research to know what buyers are caring about, mm -hmm. what they're asking for. And yeah, if you, if you have that at the ready, even if it's not in your data room, but you can be like, oh, sure, here it is. You know, it doesn't take that seven days to get it. Again, you're just, you're just establishing that really good um, first impression, first, second, third impression that then will carry over into hopefully, you know, smoother negotiations when you get to all the nuanced uh, deal points. The best one I'd seen is a little marketing firm. Not only did they have all their financials together, they had all their um, cash flow statements, balance sheets, you know, everything you would ask for, uh, sample contracts in, the, in their data room so you could see what their contracts look like. Uh, even three different versions of it. You can see what they look like now. You can see what they look like five years ago because some of those are still in play and still active. They also had a thing in there called videos and it had the three top executives had a video of who they are, why they were, you know, whether or not they were going to stay. Here's what they brought to the table. Here's their experience. And they are aware that, you know, this process is happening and they're fully on board with helping select a new owner. That was impressive. Right. And then they did a video tour of the facility. So you, they didn't want a bunch of people because the employees didn't know they didn't want a bunch of people flying in and touring the facility. Uh, so they just get a video walkthrough. It's a marketing firm. So they, they put together their own package. So unfortunately, he had an inflated view of what he wanted for it. <laughs> you know, he wanted <laughs> PE prices for, for a, you know, he wanted multiples of seven to nine X on something that should be in, in, in a market that they were going for four. Right. So. It was just one of those. We couldn't get to where he wanted to be. And, you know, our only advice was grow a little bit. And, you, you know, you guys are well enough put together. You double in size over the next, you know, 18 months. You'll wake up the PE guys. You'll wake up those guys that want it. And that's who pays for that. That's who pays. Our goal would be to buy you, do those, you know, to double you in, in 18 months and maybe offer you, uh, you know, to a PE firm if they take us along for the ride. Right. So, you know, we'd sell a big chunk off to the PE firm is exactly what we would do with you. Yeah. And, they, and that kind of gets at the, you know, the value of working with an experienced like investment banker, M&A advisor mm -hmm. is they're going to help. They're not just going to help you with the deal itself. They're going to help you with that, getting that data room together. And they're going to look at, you know, your financials, your customer contracts. They're going to look at things like, are your contracts assignable, right? If a buyer wants to do an asset structure as opposed to like a direct stock purchase, that impacts on how you're able to transfer all that business to the new owner. These are all these kind of legal and accounting and, you know, all these little details you have to think about investment bankers, right? They're going to look at all that and they're going to, they're going to probably, in addition to advising you on the deal itself, probably help you get the company itself, like right? get revenues and expenses, 
um, financial reporting. They're going to help with operational side things too. So even if the transaction doesn't end up closing, you still get the benefit of a really knowledgeable business advisor helping you on the operational side of things. Let's hit on some of the reasons buyers do back away. And the one I want to hit on first, or on, from the buyer's side, one of the main reasons I know that people walk away is the, uh, the earnout agreement. They look at this and go, you know, I've never been a good employee. It's the reason I'm an entrepreneurial. And you're wanting me to hang out. Like a lot of times there's a, uh, like a requirement to stay for two years or three years or f- like for a while there are some of these industries that are wanting them to stay for five. And, uh, you know, they're like, I don't think I could be a great employee for somebody else for three years. Right. So, and I'm going to lose half the equity in this. Like, there's money tied to these earnouts. I'm going to lose, you know, half of the deal if I leave early. Uh, and I know I, I've seen articles that I've read, uh, listened to podcasts and stuff where people had millions of dollars on the line to stay and they still were just like, I can't be here anymore. And they walk away and never realize the full value yeah. because of these earnouts. So why don't you describe to us what an earnout is, what's common inside of them. So those who don't know what it is, and let's remove some of the fear and set the right expectations so that if somebody goes into a deal, they know that they should be expecting this and what it, you know, what it, what it looks like and what, what's negotiable inside of them. Yeah. So then the key word there that you said is expectations. So um, so an earnout, it, it's a pretty simple concept. It's basically instead of getting that money as a guaranteed payment at closing, right? You probably still get something at closing on these deals that have an earnout. The deal parties push out some of that uh, deal consideration and they make it contingent. So the the business after the buyer takes over and starts running it, there's going to be some sort of metric, some sort of goal. And if that goal is hit, then that additional amount of money gets paid to the sellers. And there's there's a bunch of different ways to structure it. They're highly customizable, and they're I mean, deal parties spend a lot of time negotiating earnouts, and they should because they're it's very important to kind of get all the details right. Um, because usually the expectation around the earnout um, on the sell side, right, the sellers are very familiar with the business. They're very optimistic and confident about what the business can do. So usually sellers have a pretty high expectation when it comes to that earnout being achieved and, and receiving those, um, those amounts post-closing. Buyers, on the other hand, they want, they, I mean, buyers, if you have a buyer that's sort of indicating that they are, you know, trying to structure in a way where it looks like they are really trying to get out of paying the earnout, and you can sense that early on, that's a bad, that's, that's a bad sign, right? I'm not saying you necessarily need to walk away from that deal, but be very mindful because even though buyers want that business to do well post-closing, right? Because that means the asset they just bought is more, you know, has the value that they wanted it to have. Theoretically, buyers are going to want to pay those, those earnouts. But what actually happens in practice, right? We're talking about a post-closing period where no one can predict what's going to happen. So the fact is there are just so many variables that can come into play that potentially are going to knock out that earnout. Um, and a big part of that, right, is you have to remember that the buyer is buying this target business, but they also have other businesses, right? And maybe they're a strategic buyer and they're combining it all together. Um, maybe they are going to continue to run it separately, but the buyer is going to have competing priorities. And so if there's an economic shift, right, which we saw, you know, 2021 was this incredible year and then kind of things shifted on a macroeconomic level. And we saw this, we kind of refer to it as like buyer remorse claims, where they realize, wow, we paid a lot for this company or we promised a really big earnout, and we just don't think the company is worth that anymore, right? That's what the contract says and it's binding. We signed it. And so buyers do, um, you know, they'll get aggressive, right? They, you know, they won't, they won't act inappropriately, right? They're not going to make um, like frivolous claims or things like that, but they will get more aggressive in, you know, finding ways to kind of show, oh, actually, we don't think the earnout was actually hit or it was only partially hit. So when you're setting up these earnout structures, you know, it's it's contingent consideration, right? It's not guaranteed. So that's really important, especially when you're the seller. And and you know, it's not always an action of the buyer, right? If if the seller does need to stay and continue to run that business, right, and they're under contract to do that and, and they leave early, right? That can also impact the earnout. So it's not just what buyers do, but sell side can have an impact as well. It's just it's not guaranteed. Um, so when you're negotiating these deals, you know, one, one piece of advice I would give is, you know, the, the more you can get up front is, is probably best, right? And so working with an investment banker or an advisor, probably going to tell you the same thing. And they're going to work to try and maximize that guaranteed closing payment, as opposed to relying too much on an earnout. 
But in the the way things are, earnouts are pretty common. So what's what's pretty fascinating. So when you have a private target M and A deal, right? So you know, including these smaller deals that are maybe in the five or ten million dollar range, typically, and and um, I will say when we're talking about earnouts, if if it's a life science deal, earnouts are structured very differently. So like if it's a, a a company that's developing a new drug or medical device or something like that, those typically they're not you know, those tiny, tiny companies anyway. Um, but those are structured very differently. So I'm not talking about life science deals, but kind of, you know, tech deals, you know, media companies, right? Retail companies, all, all those kinds of things. About one in five of those are probably going to have an earn out. So they're not on a majority of deals, um, but on smaller deals they are a little bit more common than they are on larger deals. Last year though, was like this really interesting year, uh, you know, a little bit slower deal making going on. And there was th- these valuation gaps, right? So sellers were kind of thinking like 2021 market and like really high valuations. Buyers were like looking at, okay, well, well now we've got high interest rates, right? We, you know, we were just dealing with high inflation. There's a lot of uncertainty in the economy right now. Of course, we're in a presidential election year, so that always can have an impact. Um, so buyers are living in the current reality. They're not willing to put those huge guaranteed upfront payments. So we are seeing this kind of push for more earnouts. And so last year it was actually one in three deals. So that that was a pretty big spike up in the number of earnouts that that we saw last year. Not quite as many in the current year in 2024 so far. Maybe kind of getting back to that one in five range. Um, but but common enough that you might come up, you know, you might get a term sheet where the buyer is proposing an earnout structure. Um, so just remember, very very important to spend the time carefully negotiating those to make sure you get the language right and set your expectations. You know, I would say. I mean, we know less than half of the deals with an earnout actually have an amount paid on the earnout. So the chances of you actually seeing that money, you know, certainly not 100%, maybe maybe even less than 50% chance that you'll actually see that earnout money. Yeah. I know that some of the guys out there teaching at the uh, the consultants and the gurus or whatever you want to call them, teaching small business mergers and acquisitions, they'll teach that if you're close, like close to your evaluation and what they want, then you can structure these earn out agreements and put it in there and just make sure it's the way they put it is make sure you're going to be happy to pay that if they hit the numbers. So a lot of times they, it's being taught if you can't, if you're just, if you're just off and, and as long as it's not so ridiculous, you're never like, I'm never going to be able to pay them what they want unless we put some ridiculous terms in there. Right. And nobody wants to do that because if you do that, you know, basically all you're asking for is a, one of one party is going to sue the other at the end of this because somebody's going to be really disgruntled. That if it's close, yeah. you know, they're teaching, if it's close, put it in the earn out, you know, have them help you get to where it needs to be to where that payment, that extra hundred thousand, two hundred thousand million dollars, whatever it happens to be, isn't going to bug you is it, it, it's, it's a legitimate value for what they've added post close. So I think it's being taught more, uh, to put these type of structures in because the market is at a dis, a lot of, it's a, a missing of information, right? the sellers lag in keeping up with what the buyers are willing to pay because they're always looking at historical data, right? They're pull, right. they're Googling and a lot of times they're looking at the wrong historical data. You, they've got a business doing two and a half million dollars seller's discretionary and EBITDA and they're look, Googling it and they're seeing what the PE firms are paying for five, 10, 15 million dollar EBITDA and they don't understand there's this game, right? There's these thresholds where it instantly goes up. There's these arbitrage type of areas where if you can buy it and get it past that threshold, you could, you know, go from a 3x, 4x to a 7x, right? But they, the buyers don't see that because, you know, there's nothing inside of the Google story that says that these four companies sold at 7x. It says, oh, yeah, it's because they were above that threshold. So yeah. what are some of the other things? Yeah, and, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, it's interesting because we tend to see private equity. Yeah, they tend to kind of focus on larger size deals. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's also important to think about that buyer type because, you know, private equity, there's there's a lot of advantages to going with private equity. I mean, you know, they're going to have a ton of experience in the space, especially if they're kind of um, looking at a platform, right, where they're kind of bringing in multiple um, companies that maybe are going to be sister companies and kind of looking at synergies like that. Um, but on the flip side, right, like don't discount strategics, right? Strategics, strategic buyers can be a really powerful partner. But very different how how those buyers you know versus private equity buyers are going to negotiate the deal. So understanding those differences can can be important too. So you know a strategic 
you're selling the value, the synergy, right? The upside, the advantages they're going to get by adding this to their, their current portfolio of an operating business. Um, and so maybe you can find some more value there versus like an investor type buyer, right? Like private equity, they're going to be looking at the numbers. They're going to be looking at EBITDA and thinking about multiples and it's all going to boil down to what your numbers are. Um, so thinking about the right partner on the buy side can have a big impact on A, how the deal is going to get negotiated, where these deal terms are going to land, and ultimately what value you can get out of it. Interesting. What are some of the other um, things that are happening in this space that the buyer, sorry, the uh, seller, we'll get to the buyer in a minute, that the seller should be aware of to make sure that they can be ready and, and, and not be surprised by the paperwork to get the deal done? Yeah. Well, one, um, one thing that we're seeing a lot, not on a majority of deals, and actually, you know, in the last couple of years, it, it, the usage has come down a little bit, but there is this thing out there called reps and warranties insurance. So, um, so just really quickly, like reps and warranties are basically the seller making certain statements of fact to the buyer, right? Like we're not being sued by anyone. All our employees are correctly classified. You know, we're not dumping toxic waste in the river. Right. You make all these statements of fact being like, we don't have all, you know, there's not liability here. And if, if it turns out one of those statements is wrong, right, then that's a breach of that rep and warranty. And so buyers is often indemnified for that, meaning that post closing, the sellers might have to kind of cough up that amount of money, right? If it was a, you know, million dollar uh, loss to the buyer, right? Sellers are going to have to go in their pockets. Usually, though, you don't, you don't actually have to go collect it from the sellers. You usually set aside some money at closing. That that's the escrow on these M&A deals. Um, so you would hope that that escrow would be large enough to cover any of those claims. 10% is kind of, you know, kind of what's market for an indemnification escrow. But what this reps and warranties insurance product is meant to do is sort of shift that risk away from the sellers being on the hook for those post-closing claims and having an insurance product there. Um, and so a lot of sellers and so private equity buyers are a little bit more likely to use RWI. It's kind of a financial product that they're a little bit more used to. Um, and on the sell side, I think sellers see it as this like, oh, this kind of takes a bunch of you know risk off of us and transfers it to this insurance policy. But what, you know, and RWI has been around for a couple of decades, but it's really the last seven, eight years that it's kind of gained some traction. Um, but even since then, right, we're seeing the market kind of pull away from it, you know, in the last couple of years, because we're now understanding how it actually works and plays out. So I'm using this as like an example of buyers are going to, buyers and sellers are going to come together and they're going to try and find compromises, middle ground to get comfortable, feel the deal is reasonable and be able to, you know, actually move forward with closing. And so sometimes RWI is thrown around as a way of like, oh, well, this takes a lot of a risk off with sellers and you know, it's, it's, it's an additional transaction expense, right? Cause you have to pay the insurance premium, but that's offset by the fact that maybe you don't have to have as large of an escrow. But if you go and look at the data right there, you know, brokers are putting out data on sort of how often claims are made and how often they're paid on these policies. Um, we have data about like, you know, we actually see more claims on deals with RWI than deals without it, which is kind of interesting, right? It sort of seems counterintuitive um, or counterproductive anyway. Um, so as a seller, I think it's really important, you know, there are all these things, just very detailed kind of middle ground or compromise and really understand, and, and every deal is unique, right? So it might make sense for one deal, but on another deal, you know, maybe not as much, you know, we're talking about lower middle market, not as common to see RWI just cause it's, it's expensive, right? There's usually like a minimum amount of coverage that you have to acquire under an RWI policy. And that might be 100% of the value of the deal. And so you're going to be paying a lot of money for that coverage that maybe you don't, you don't need that amount of coverage. So on lower middle market deals, we do see RWI, like maybe about 10% of deals um, in less than 25 million have, have RWI. Um, but it's, it's important that you, if you're being offered something like that, do your research, right? Look at what, I mean, we put out a lot of information and data around RWI. Brokers do, the ABA talks about RWI, uh, the American Bar Association. There's a lot of really great information. And lately, right, we've been seeing this pullback from using RWI just given how it actually plays out. And so I don't mean to like pick on RWI too much. I'm just using that as one example. Um, you know, another thing buyers are probably, or sorry, sellers are probably going to go up against similar to RWI. Uh, if there's not insurance coverage for a particular risk, buyers are asking for not just that general indemnity escrow but additional escrows to cover very specific purposes. So one of the most common claims that we see post-closing come up with these reps and warranty claims uh, is around taxes. 
so many times you have a, you have a small company who maybe doesn't realize that, oh, they actually have sales or use tax um, obligations in a jurisdiction that they're not physically in, but they have customers located there. And so when the buyer comes in and the buyer maybe has that global or national footprint, they're looking at sales and use tax in all those jurisdictions. So very, very common that there, there are those kind of tax matters that come up. Um, financial statements is another one where, you know, especially if you don't have audited financial statements, the buyer probably going to be way more conservative in their approach to gap accounting and how financial statements are prepared. You know, buyers and sellers, right, they're, they're coming at it from very different places, depending on, you know, what we're talking about. And so understanding what the buyer is really offering and if it actually is better for you or, or maybe not as desirable for you, you just got to do the work and you got to talk to the right people and do that research to really understand. Because sometimes it might be like, hey, this is actually a seller favorable thing or people talk about it being seller favorable. But for your deal, maybe it actually is detrimental. So it's, it's just important to be really careful in reviewing all the details. Uh, just for a public announcement for you guys out there listening, if you're looking at that reps and warranties insurance and you can't find an insurance and you want to check into it and you can't and you start Googling and you, you, and you see that most of them don't insure uh, deals under 20 to 25 million dollars in structure. There's, there's actually two now that I know of here in the United States. So you dig deeper. There are ones that will do the smaller deals. And often the seller buys it to try to push back, at least in that they're pitched to the lower market deals for the seller to buy them to, to stop some of the earn out and owner carry some of that risk. Cause they like, cause now the risk is not on the buyer being, you know, is the seller going to spend all the money before <laughs> we figure out if they, if they miss something. There's an insurance policy to do that. So less money, the, the pitch is less money will be you know, held in escrow if they have these insurance policies in place. But I know, I think they're both underwritten by the same insurance company. I think it's like Lloyd's of London or something uh, that are writing these smaller uh, M&A deal uh, reps and warranties things. But there's at least two agencies here uh, that, uh, and I know one of the guys that is a partner at one of them. So I know, I know they, they do have them in the smaller markets. Uh, but up until about two, three years ago, it was just for the uh, $10 million, $20 million, $30 million transactions and above. You, you, you'd have a hard time finding an insurance company that would underwrite anything smaller. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The other thing I would mention that I think is really important to think about and, and, and gets overlooked um, quite a bit, especially on kind of smaller deals where maybe it's, you know, it's the first time those folks are making an exit. If there are these post-closing matters, like an earn out, indemnification period, right? Like usually the survival for indemnity is 12 months. Well, actually on smaller deals, usually it's like 18, sometimes even 24 months. That's how long you're kind of on the hook for that claim um, or potential claim coming up. Once the buyer owns the company, right? Unless you work for buyer and kind of have access to everything, you're going to have no insight into what's going on at that company anymore. And if you've got an earn out, right? That says, hey, if they hit a certain revenue goal, you get this extra payout. You're going to want to be able to monitor that and have some insight into, okay, is the buyer doing everything they should be doing in order to hit these goals? How close are they, right? If it's a two-year um, performance period, you know, you might want to have quarterly or at least annual check-ins. So basically what I'm talking about here are information rights, having the ability to ask those questions, get regular reporting post-closing so that you can monitor your own, your own rights, right? And protect the value that's still at play. When it comes to these indemnification claims or earnouts, because once the deal closes, the, the, the power dynamics do kind of shift and buyers are going to have way more leverage. And if the contract doesn't spell out exactly what the buyer has to provide you in terms of this ongoing information, you probably won't get anything out of them because why would they, right? They're not incentivized to do that. They're not contractually required to do it. So putting it in the contract, really, really important because we see it all the time where we get to the end of a two-year earnout period. And you know the sellers think, hey, everything's going well. The buyer seems happy. We were really confident that they were going to hit these numbers. And then all of a sudden, two years after the deal, they get a notice that says, nope, we didn't hit the revenue or the you know whatever the metric was. You're not getting the earnout. I guarantee you, it's not just a you know sense of professional disappointment, but people are emotionally invested, right? They'll they'll respond emotionally, um, having been kept in the dark, and then all of a sudden getting that shock result. So it's good for buyers too because if things aren't going well but you're regularly communicating that, then at least that sets up, again, we're going back to expectations, right? And at least kind of um, isn't as much of a shock for the sellers uh, when you get to the final point. And just we, so we caught it, you can put that in the contractually, or I know of some cases where it's like, 
this the seller's like i'm gonna hold until we do the earn out i'm gonna hold five percent uh of the uh the company that way i'm legally guys if they I, I guess if they own a certain percentage of the company you legally have to show them the finances right there's you know some type and i guess it could be state by state but uh so we can contractually to, you know, put certain things in the buy sell agreements and the everything else that says that we get accurate quarterly results. How do we prove the accuracy of those, though? I mean, uh, do, is there something that says we can audit them <laughs> if there's a discrepancy? Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's that's a really great point too. It's not just sort of getting information from them, but having the ability to follow up. Mm-hmm. So it, when we act as shareholder rep, what we find is really helpful is just having access to folks on the buy side who are actually involved in the operation of of the target business, mm-hmm. right? Because you're right, if you're an investor in, in the buyer post-closing, there's certain information about the buyer as a whole you can get. But for an earnout, it might be did this one particular division hit a certain revenue metric. And that might be a financial metric that isn't disclosed, you know, right, to to owners of the company. Um, and so yeah, you can put in the contract and say, you know, we want regular reporting on on these financial metrics. And we want to be able to like call the accountant who prepared that statement or call the manager of that particular business line and ask them and follow up and say, hey, we, the numbers are a little bit lower than we were expecting. What's going on here? And they're like, oh, we've got headwinds here. Or we had to pull out of this market or, you know, one of our salespeople left, right? You can get that kind of further clarification. Um, but also you just have to trust the buyer. You know, we had, we had one uh, deal where it kind of blew up post-closing and ended up going to, to litigation. And the, the judge actually said to the deal parties in court, I think you picked the wrong dance partners on this deal. I mean, that's, you know, usually, usually judges will, will be very neutral, right? They won't make sort of commentary like that. So it was a big deal and, and just stresses the importance of, you know, if you don't trust the buyer, right, then, then that, there's an underlying problem there you should probably be looking at. Um, so that trust is, is an important component as well. Yeah, I think uh, that's a ongoing theme. I tell people all the time, if I ever create any type of educational product inside of the mergers and acquisitions space, it's not going to be on buying uh, buying businesses or selling businesses or making yourself exit ready. It's going to be on rapport, right? Building rapport, uh, understanding what the other person's trying to, uh, to achieve. And uh, I think in, in business in general, if you had two superpowers in business, I, and you could succeed in any business, the minus touch, I would say, being able to interact with others and, and build deep rapport and being a hell of a storyteller. So if you can do the two things, if you look at, and don't anybody argue, argues with me about the storyteller, look at WeWork, look at some of the other things. Horrible business model, uh, amazing storyteller, right? And people bought in the story, invested in it. If you can tell a hell of a story and build deep rapport with people, you can write your ticket in, in any of these businesses. But it goes together. It goes along with this mergers and acquisitions too. Both the buyer and seller ought to seek to build deep rapport and understand whether and whether or not they know, like, and trust this other individual, because it isn't a, a one and done. You're not getting a check stroked and it's done. You know, ninety percent of these deals have, uh, not in my world. You know, there's there's always something that can come back and bite you, right? And you would rather have touch rapport with that if if somebody if the seller or the buyer suspects the other side of doing something. If you have deep, deep rapport, then you call the guy up and go, hey, this is what I'm seeing. What's going on? Or, hey, we just lost our number one account. I thought they were hanging out. What can you do to help us get those people back on board? Right? And it's the rapport that gets you there. So many people think this is about numbers and think this is about hard negotiation tactics, you know, uh, tactics and, you know, BATNA, best alternative to negotiated outcome and all these different things. And it's like, if, did, did you even find out if the guy likes you? <laughs> right? You're not going to get a deal done with anybody who hates your guts. And you could, but you're going to regret it if you do. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you're on the business side of the transaction, yeah, you've got to be focused on that relationship piece of it, as well as kind of negotiating the high level business terms. And then, you know, let the lawyers, let the accountants, the investment bankers, they can deal with all the, all the nitty gritty details. And they do, right? Because you're right. Sometimes, you know, people are smooth talkers, right? And sometimes you kind of need to see through that a little bit. And again, having the right advisors that have the experience and they kind of know what to look for, you know, what's real and, and what's sort of smoke and mirrors, that goes a long way as well. Can I, I'll, I'll can my attorney in a heartbeat if they're not trying to build rapport with the other attorney. If they're just trying to conflict and, you know, and everything's abrasive, that doesn't work on the attorney side. In my world anyway, it doesn't work that way either. Uh, I expect them to maybe not love each other, but to have 
co- conversations at, at the intellectual level and the emotional, uh, what do they call it, EQ or whatever, like the both be emotion, mm-hmm. emotionally uh, mature enough to where they they can push through a conversation and get to get to a result due to either mutual respect or whatever. But if you can't build that, if you're, and there's a lot of attorneys just they've never been trained in that. They've never been trained in. I got to talk to this other, you know. I'm going to throw my terms over and then I'm going to argue with any terms they throw over. That's just not the way this stuff gets done. And, and it and it kills more deals, especially at the small business uh, side. If the lawyers are fighting, it, the owners are so scared that this is their lifetime. This is their baby. The owners are so scared at getting through this process anyway. When the lawyers start fighting, they immediately distrust the other party because there's got to be something wrong with them, right? The, or the other party's attorney. And a lot of these deals don't make it through. Because the attorneys think they have to get tough with each other instead of just sitting down and have a conversation. Go, hey, you know, what do you see as a no go, and what do you, where, what can we do about that? And oh no, no, this is what I have to have, and there's what we can do about that. And you just go back and forth, and you know, it's funny is I've had attorneys, you know, go back and forth like that. And I said, did you ever ask the seller what they really cared about? Well, my job's to you know represent the best interest of the, uh, the client. And I was like, yeah, but I'm pretty sure I've talked to the I've talked to the seller a bunch. I don't think you'd give a crap about half that stuff you're like fighting over. Yeah. Or on the flip side. Yeah, yeah exactly. Or, or if there's if there's something that the buyer or the seller themselves kind of are really digging their heels in, but their advisors are maybe saying, hey, this is this might blow up the deal if you, you know, kind of stick your guns here and that it can go both ways. Mm-hmm. I think at the end of the day, no one wants like whether you're the buyer, the seller, or your deal counsel or an inv- like no one wants to be the one responsible for the deal not happening so that. Usually there is there is an incentive for everyone to play nice in the sandbox, right? Because we all want to get the deal done, right? Where all our interests are aligned to to get to closing. So usually you can keep people behaving, but yeah, you got to you got to keep the communication, you know, w- within your own team and you know between buyers and sellers, just absolutely crucial that you have that transparent, open communication. Well, awesome! I just realized we're over the hour, man. It's fun chatting with you. You're full of knowledge, <laughs> and I think we could go on for a long time. But let's do a couple of things real quick. First of all. How do people get out, reach a, you know, reach out and get a hold of you? How do people uh, work with you if they've got something they need looked at? Uh, what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, absolutely. So first thing I would recommend, again, you want to like, get as much information as you can. So first I would go to our website, srsaquium.com and go to our insights section. That's where you can find our deal term study. So like, you know, when I was quoting, you know, one in five deals have an earn out and two thirds of deals have an indemnification escrow, all that kind of data lives in our deal term study. It's free to download on our website. So start, you know, I would start there. And then, yeah, our, our mission is to make your lives easier when it comes to getting these M&A deals done. So we're always happy to chat with you or kind of hear, you know, hear what issues you're facing, maybe connect you with, with folks that, that can help you on, you know, we don't act as deal counsel or as an investment banker, um, but we have, you know, connections with people across the industry. Um, so yeah, you can reach out via email. It's just, K Wallen at srsaquium.com. I'm always happy to at least point you in the right direction if, if I'm not able to answer your question directly for you. Awesome. And then uh, the th- we always do a three takeaways. If somebody can only remember one or two things, maybe three uh, from the show today, what, what do you want them to walk away with? What do you want them to remember? Yeah. So for lower middle market exits, you know, first work with the right team, right? Uh, look at who you need in terms of advisors, accountants, lawyers, and hire the right people. That is, that is probably the biggest thing, you know, in terms of accelerating or decelerating the success of your deal. I mean, honestly, I think investment bankers usually pay for themselves. Just the fact that they have connections with potential buyers, and then they can help negotiate the specifics of the deal, preserve value, maybe even get a higher valuation for you, a higher multiple. That's, what, that's their job. And they're really good at it. Um, so those advisors usually pay for themselves. They're expensive. I get it. But, you know, very much worth it. So put the right team together set your expectations uh, in line with what's actually happening in the current market. So educate yourself, right? Don't, don't let yourself be ignorant in the pejorative or non-pejorative sense, right? You know, there's no excuse. There's so much information out there. Of course, there's what we publish. There's a plethora of other data and, and resources available. So, so do, you, do your diligence, right? Do your research um, and just get as informed as you can about how these things are negotiated. What are the common terms? What's market? All, all those sorts of things. And then I think the third thing is just know right now in the current market, buyers are being very thorough and careful in their acquisition strategy. So expect robust due diligence, expect thorough uh, negotiations, even if it's a smaller deal, 
Um, you know, you might, especially if you're working with a private equity buyer, they might be bringing in, you know, their very sophisticated law firms and, and advisors um, who are going to, who are going to look at all those details, even on smaller deals, because um, buyers are just being mindful and want to protect their investments. So have that data room as clean as possible, right? Be as prepared, get ahead of things. You want to set the best first impression that you can. And just know that buyers are going to ask a lot of questions and they're going to want a lot of answers. And that's just, that's just the, what it takes. That's just the current market for deal making. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today, Kip. I'd love to check in with you every once in a while and see how the, the market's changing. Maybe in a six months to a year, we'll, we'll have an update on what's going on in the space. We'll wrap this up. We'll call it a show. Thank you for being here and hang out for just a minute. All right. Thanks, Ron. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now